So on Wednesday, when I was down here working in the office, I took a break and I shot some baskets in Friendship Hall. And while I was doing that, a memory bubbled to the surface. Now, you look at this magnificent physical specimen standing up here in this pulpit, and you're not going to believe this, but I'm not an athlete. I never was much good at sports, though I always kept trying. And this memory, I remember when I was 15 years old or so and playing a game of pickup basketball, and as you may know, basketball requires grace and coordination that I badly lacked. And after losing the ball to another player who made a basket on us, one of the guys looked at me and yelled at me in frustration, Bowerman, what good are you? Since I remember that all these years later, it must have cut pretty deep. And I would guess that a lot of you this morning have had people say or do things that made you feel the same way. So if you can relate to that at all, what good are you? I have some very, very good news for you from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, that God, before time began, willed that you would exist, and through Christ has chosen you, specifically you, to be God's child. You have worth and beauty to God beyond your imagining. What difference does this make? Well, if you're just an accident, say, of random mutation, evolution, you really have no inherent worth. Your worth is what whatever society deems worthy. Could be a matter of how smart or how talented you are, how much money you have, how good looking you are. But what about people who don't have those things or those achievements? What good are they? The ethicist Peter Singer of Princeton University has written about the implications of this and said, the notion that human life is sacred just because it is human life is medieval. He believes that a creature's worth is based on its intelligence and that an intelligent chimp has more right to life than, say, a child with Down syndrome. Now, Singer's views seem monstrous, but all he's done is work out the implications of the view that there really is nothing special or unique about humankind. The Bible says consistently that there is something special and unique about you. Before the universe existed, God had you in God's mind and determined that one day you should exist. And so here you are today. And I want you not to just let that thought into your mind, but try to feel it. That this God of immense power and beauty and intelligence, out of the love that is the core of God's being, God decided that you would exist. You are good and worthy for that reason alone, and nobody, nothing, no how can ever take that away. But there's more here in this reading. Paul says that God not only determined that you would be, if you are in Christ, that means God chose you, predestined you to be his child. Now, that word predestination causes some people to roll their eyes and think, oh, here we go again with the medieval theology. But predestination is a huge relief for us driven people who think our worth is based on what we do. It's like this. A few years back, the website of the Chicago Bears had a series of videos that presented the journey of the team's rookies for their first arrival at training camp and then all through the preseason. And one of the videos showed then coaches then Coach Lovey Smith's first orientation talk with the rookie class. Now, of course, the biggest thing on the mind of each rookie in training camp is whether he's going to make the team. The team roster began with 80 players that came to camp. 
After a few weeks, the coaches cut that roster down to 65 players. Then before the season actually begins, the NFL requires that all rosters be at a maximum of 53 players. Of the 19 rookies that were invited to the Bears training camp that year, only seven would likely be invited to be part of the team. So the coach, Levy Smith, knew that and he challenged the rookies. Make us put you on the team. In other words, play so well that the coaches couldn't bear to cut you. Make us put you on the team. Take the decision out of the coaches' hands. Let your performance make the decision for us. Now that makes a lot of sense for football, but what a disaster if God operated that way. You want to be worth something. You want eternal life. Live such a good life that God is forced to put you on the team, so to speak. Paul is telling us that God has had his eye on you and for some unfathomable reason chose you to receive God's love and blessings, chose you to be adopted at his child, chose you to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity, totally apart from anything you are or you do. Why you? Why me? Heck if I know. It's surely not because we're something special. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus. I offer this to you, my friends, as really good and comforting news that our worth, our faith, our salvation, don't rest on what the world says makes a person valuable. Don't rest on our achievements or how much faith we can summon up on a given day. Those things rest entirely in God saying, I want you and you and you. If you love and trust Jesus Christ, you do so because God set his heart on you and you belong to him forever. I want to push deeper into this for a minute. One of the reasons so many of us are anxious and unhappy is that we're basing our worth on something other than what God says about us. Henry Nouwen said that there are three great lies that many Americans have bought into. I am what I have, I am what I do, I am what other people say or think about me. What other people say or think about me. And man, that can sink deep into us. They told you, you're not smart enough, attractive enough, talented enough, athletic enough. You're the wrong race or ethnicity or from the wrong family. And maybe we're not high IQ or dazzlingly attractive. Maybe you weren't and aren't good at sports or gifted and talented at something. And you look at yourself and you remember what people have, have said about you or done to you and you've internalized that. And you think, what good am I? And believe you're less than other people. You're flawed and defective. For others of us, we feel anxious and unhappy because we think we haven't found some great purpose for our lives. The pressure people are under here, like for teenagers and college students. You better go to college. You better choose the right college and the right major so you can have a career that shows you matter, that you're worth something. Others of us groan more, same kind of pressure. Your job pays the bills, but it's just a job. And since you've tied your worth and value to what you do, you're not sleeping at night, you're wondering, what good am I? and desperately searching for something that would demonstrate you do matter and ease your anxiety. As one writer put it, 
The fact is, real life is long on law and short on grace. The demands never stop, the failures pile up, and fears set in. Life in this culture requires so much from us. A successful career, a stable marriage, well-behaved and emotionally adjusted children, a certain quality of life. Is it any wonder we're all so weary? We live with long lists of things to accomplish, people to please, situations to manage. Anyone living inside the guilt, anxiety, stress, strain, and uncertainty of daily life knows from instinct and from hard experience that the weight of life is heavy. We all need some relief. Relief. Hear me now. You have nothing to prove, Christian. God had you in mind before time began and brought you into the world and gave you faith and thinks you are beautiful and marvelous right now. Sure, you and I need to grow and mature, and sure, God gives us stuff to do building God's kingdom, but we do that out of a foundation of, of security that we are loved and valuable now. And this is part of what Jesus meant when he said, Come to me, all you, who, you, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. And speaking of a great purpose for our lives, Paul says in our reading that God has let us in on a great secret, his great plan for the world, which is to save and to heal the whole world. And for us, that's even more good news because, as Philip Yancey put it, the good news of the gospel means that every one of us can have a sense of destiny to play a part in God's great story. And Paul says two things about this part we have to play. In verse 9 and 10, he says that God, God's great plan is to, is to gather everything up in Christ meaning that the world is headed for a wonderful new beginning where, where Christ rules with love and justice. And everything that's wrong and broken and cruel and unjust is no more. And then he says in verse 12 that we are, we are chosen by God to live for the praise of his glory. Now, living for the praise of his glory, that, that may not sound very appealing. It, it may sound like an endless worship service. It Reminds me of a meme I saw in Facebook that showed a woman trying to stay awake in church and it said, there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> when we live together for the praise of God's glory, it means that Christ is calling us to connect with, to participate in what God is already doing to birth a new world amid the ruins of this one. It means lifting up the lowly and working for justice and freedom. It means sharing the love of Jesus Christ. It means confronting evil with the power of the Spirit. And note that every time that Paul uses you, the word you in this text, it's not singular, it's second person plural, meaning us all, meaning God does this through us, through us together in the community of the church. And this means that your life is more epic than you think because Jesus loves you and God has revealed his great secret of his plan to save the world through Christ and your life gets woven into God's great plan. And this changes how we see ourselves and our lives. Nothing is different, but everything is different. When we wipe a child's runny no nose or pray for yet another suffering friend. When we go to work and try to shine for Christ by showing up in time and doing good work. When we love and forgive people, we'd rather just give the heave-ho out of our lives. When we stand with and for people who are being kept down. If we give our lives over to God, he uses all that stuff we think is ordinary and puny. And one day in the new creation, one day we will see how we made a difference. God's great plan to gather up all things in Christ is the hope of the world, and our world is desperate for hope right now. 
Uh, here's a story that comes from Reed University in Portland, Oregon, which is one of the most liberal colleges in the whole country. Not a place you would think would be hospitable to the message of the gospel. Now, John Perkins was invited to speak at Reed, and Perkins is one of the last remaining leaders of the civil rights movement. He's also a deeply committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for that reason alone, the organizers of the talk were highly nervous, thinking maybe nobody would come or would protest because of Perkins' Christianity. But on the evening when Perkins was going to speak, the large auditorium was just packed. Perkins was introduced, and he began by telling his story of growing up in a time of great racial and social injustice. He told this, the history of the civil rights movement, the murder of his brother, the times he was arrested and jailed, the beatings he endured in jail. He unapologetically insisted that disparities of race and class still exist today. And then he took off his reading glasses, walked to the front of the stage, and finished like this. There is one more thing. There is no hope apart from the reconciling work of Jesus Christ. There is no hope apart from a revival of God's love across this country. There is no hope apart for our broken communities, apart from the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. There is no hope to reverse racism, to heal poverty, to return dignity to all people. There is no hope for my people and you and your people here at Reed College. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our only hope. And then, like a sonic boom, 400 students rose to their feet and filled the space with applause. Ten seconds turned to 30. One minute turned to two. Time stopped. And those students in that deeply secular place stood and honored that man who spoke of Jesus Christ. Paul says in our reading that we've been given that great secret of the gospel, that in Christ God will gather up all things, all the broken mess of this world, and make it whole. We know the great secret. We can live it. We can share it. We can work together to bring life to our community and beyond. That would be living for God's glory. And the amazing thing is lots of people want it when they see and understand what God is really up to, what Christ is really like. Friends, what good are you? You are created by God. You were chosen by him before time began, and you were called by God to help heal this broken world. That sounds plenty good to me. Amen.